joining us again at another GPSA webinar. Tonight's webinar is uh, about telehealth and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, patients. And tonight we've got Dr. John Kelly with us. Um, welcome, John. Hi, hi. We'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which this meeting is taking place around the country in your respective parts of uh, the country and pay respects to their elders, past and present and their families. So, yes, I'm yeah, John Kelly. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm based in, well, this relates to uh, my work in North East Arnhem Land, which is where I'm still the um, a GP for the um, Aboriginal Health Services and some of the remote outstations in that area. Uh, my understanding is that the main purpose of this talk is to really go through some of the barriers to effective telehealth or remote um, communication in effect with, um, health, with the health service and how to do that effectively and, and, and basically tips and that we've learned over the time that have worked for us and things that didn't work so well. Um, I figure it's probably good to give you a bit of a background of where I'm going to relate this to um, because everyone's scenario is different and then I think knowing the scenario that I'm talking from will help you work out what you can apply in your setting. Um, so effect this this northeast aunt this um, Further, this area around Nerland Boy. Can you see my? I don't know if you can see my pointer there. I, it's that. It's that. It's that northeast corner there of the Northern Territory. Basically, it's where I'm referring to. So that's the sort of area. It's a beautiful part of the world. I'll give it a plug. And what we're talking about is health delivery to this sort of size of place. Uh, there's about we have about twelve. We've got, we technically got twenty of these, but twelve decent sized ones, and they populations can go up to 150 people. Uh, as, as little as 50 people and uh, I, I guess and the idea is we're based in in the in the nearby big town and we fly out or drive out to these communities and do the health service that way so we're quite remote um, and I guess this is not that unusual for Aboriginal remote Aboriginal communities and all that they're often remote and of course that has a lot of barriers in its own right often the there's often a, a public phone. Not many people will have phones. We'll, the clinic will tend to have a phone. The internet will be, be a bit scratchy uh, if we have it. And so that makes it quite a problem. At the same time, though, we want to deliver healthcare as effectively as we can to these places because it's very hard to go and often see a specialist. They don't particularly want to see a specialist. In, in, and now with COVID 19, it's even harder. And uh, so, we have this thing where we really want to do the best we can at the time when people are out there. And the other thing is, um, in our setting, we often have a nurse, nurse or a nurse, uh, GP trainee, and occasionally a, a senior doctor. So, um, uh, go out to these places to do the treatment. So it's sort of this question of how to do that, and even how do you sustain a GP trainee by supervision by, by when you're um, this far away? So they're the kind of uh, barriers you face. So obviously you've got the barriers of weather too, wet season, you can't, it's very hard to land on these strips. Um, they're expensive to fly in, to fly out of. You don't really wanna send people out if you don't have to. Um, you wanna be as sustainable as possible and as self-sufficient as possible. Uh, you can see that sometimes you won't be able to get out into these places for quite a while uh, if they're, that run that that air strip's certainly not going to work. They're not going to work at night, and sometimes you can even struggle to get out there by vehicle. So that's out the setting. Um, the other barrier um, uh, is the, but but I mean this is wonderful culture. It's absolutely amazing, very traditional. Uh, we don't we never. Had, I don't think we've had a suicide on the homelands in these areas in living memory, which is really quite remarkable. There's one every two or three weeks, sometimes in the town. And it just, it just shows just what a special uh, place these are for um, the Aboriginal people in this area. So certainly for the outstations we're in, that's very much the case. But it does have a, a, a tricky side, a challenge for us, because you've also got the challenges of a different culture, um, the uh, explaining health concepts to people, uh, mobility uh, and and uh, just as I, I I've been out I've been out hunting with people uh, 
from this community, these communities and that they can catch 12 fish with a spear in half an hour and then throw one at the crocodile they've been watching the entire time. But just as they're absolutely, you know, it can be absolutely amazing in certain things. They're not, they're often a little bit of out of depth with um, Western medicine because they're not the concept that they're used to. So there's a lot of challenges. Something that's interesting is they're very visual people and that comes very important for uh, telecommunications and effective um, telehealth. So I guess I was just going to give you a bit of a story about how did we, how we do telehealth in this setting. Um, I think a lot of this still can apply in any setting really. It's just um, giving you the extreme example. So we started with um, trying to deliver, um, I worked here for quite a few years uh, uh, with our team. And because everyone goes out in pairs, you're always giving phone advice. And so you, you really get quite, you know, phone advice from quite sick patients sometimes. Uh, so we had to think of ways to improve that. And then of course, I, and then I left and we didn't actually have a GP at all. Uh, so I had to go to New South Wales for a few personal reasons. But, um, the, um, but the, there's a question how to continue that. So I think the first things we started off with were just having a remote desktop and having a remote access to your um, medical files. It doesn't probably seem like anything surprising. Um, then over time, we started to realise, well, how do we, you know, we wanted to get, there was um, a push for getting some GP trainees in. There was a push for how to just to keep staff trained and all that, uh, you know, staff having adequate support. When you, and so we started introducing a few extra things. Um, it started off with, um, so bear in mind, we only had phone at this point. There was no internet, zero. Uh, so at this point, what we started doing is using um, a few things, simply just taking photos of things and getting them emailed as soon as we're in range, videos of examinations, which did involve teaching staff how to do certain examinations well. Uh, and um, uh, and then and we started using the uh, Welsh Allen cameras for the otoscopy. So you could take a photo of people's inner ear. We used tympanograms so we could do their um, uh, mobility of the ear and a eustachian tube dysfunction. We started using cameras in very unusual ways, in mouths, we could even, uh, in you know, videos, we had, I remember having a someone with a movement disorder, we didn't know what it was, and we started getting connections with all the specialist services where they actually started putting people on theatre lists based on these photos. And we started using movement disorders with the neurologist, or I remember somewhere with a movement disorder having their thing sent somewhere to, somewhere across the other part of the world, and because the guy in Melbourne didn't know, because the one in Darwin didn't know, and you know, getting a diagnosis, it was great. Um, uh, Plesiotoma has been just diagnosed in middle ear cavities. Um, so we started doing a lot of that technology. We did play around with the uh, Litt Littmann stethoscopes. They, don't, they, do, they do sound really good, but they just a bit, take a bit of a pain. They're just a bit of a pain to use, but, but they're, they're probably the best of those. But, so we started using all that stuff. I'd, I'd go up once a week and just sit in with the um, GP trainee for a week straight, just only watching their patients for the whole week. So it was like a week of direct supervision. And uh, that was our way of sort of getting to know them. And then we'd you know, start using, and then basically we'd um, start to uh, supervise them from afar using the phone and for and photos every now and then do a tutorial by PowerPoint. Um, and then we got internet and that, that was, we didn't have internet in everywhere, but that has added this level again uh, of um, supervision that we never thought we could do. And this is now where you, we use typically, we're not really fast what platform we use, quite frankly. I appreciate that um, there are some platforms that probably have better privacy uh, things, which I could um, uh, allude to, but um, Essentially, um, we just used WhatsApp, FaceTime, and Google Duo, whatever they had, really. Whatever the, but the only th main thing was that our trainees did have phones. I carry two phones, so one, so it was sort of like what, or so the idea is I have one, but if I get a call, I can go to the other. Um, or if I need to call someone, I can have this person looking at this person so I, they can see what's going on. Um, uh, sort of, un it's Anyway, that's the sort of stuff we started to do. We, I was starting to be able to, to be part of a family conference and they could see me. 
I, I think what basically what I will do today show you is just basically with a few, I'll give you a, a typical day in the clinic and just take you through an example of what I mean as of today, what we do now. So I just, um, so this might be my first patient for the day. Um, so someone would take a video of, um, so this is, this would be say our trainee, it could have been a nurse, but this actually is our trainee. This, this, all these photos had permission and all that stuff. But, um, the, this, um, uh, you know, you could, you could actually take, take them through, you could, they could say, look, I'm really not sure what's going with this person. You could listen to them retake the history. I could even see how they take the history. Uh, I can, we didn't show them the man's eyes here, but you know, often the, the camera would look at his eyes and the person feeling the, the tummy so you could see exactly how sore the belly is. Is there true peritoneism or rebound? Um, and it's amazing how much of an exam you can do this way. And it, it was really good because you could really um, uh, take in the accuracy of the assessment, which is the one thing you can't do over a phone. So this, so this might've been our first case. You can imagine it being any part of the body, quite frankly, um, well, almost. Um, this is the uh, Welsh Allen camera. Uh, have I got an example here? It's, um, these are, this Welsh Allen are just sort of, they're, they're the cheapest one. I think they're about 300 or something dollars. They're quite affordable. And what's great about them is you get these photos of your, that the trainee takes or whoever, the nurse, the Aboriginal health worker. Um, uh, and you can, they can watch on the TV. Or you might notice that the health worker is actually looking at the uh, screen. Incidentally, much better than getting so in the time of COVID too, this is a lot further away from the, um, you know, imagine an adult's face. Yeah, so it's a lot safer. And you get this sort of, you get these amazing photos. Now this isn't actually this child's, uh, this is an, an adult's one. Yeah, it does take a bit of practice to get the good photos. Um, but what you do is you get these photos and they can email them to you during the consultation. And then I might do a quick PowerPoint, just point out where the um, malleolus is and the posterior and the anterior malleolus folds, the incus. So I'll just take them through the anatomy of what they're seeing. And I'll point out, you know, here's the, here's the, here's the pathology. And, you know, sometimes we'll send this to an ENT surgeon to say, yep, yeah, get a CAT scan or, you know, we'll, and it's amazing. You just sort of, you've got this, um, and then if you combine that with a tympanogram, which is another cheap, easy thing to do and not very much training needed. Um, and the patient can see it. So the patient gets this visual feedback of what's going on. We use it pre and I can make sure people do a decent irrigation of the ear pre and post. You get this sort of, you know, so it's, it's real, it's basically stuff that we couldn't do if we did it, you know, ordinarily with usual equipment at all. Um, so that might be our next case of the day. And, you know, I probably would have sent this to the ENT surgeon and they would have told us what to do. And then they could tell the patient, you know, um, and, and if you've got a really good system, they might even tell you during the same consult before the patient even leaves or before the team leaves that, uh, that, that particular community because we do outreach. Um, this might be your next case of the day. This is a lady with a diabetic foot ulcer. And uh, this, in this one, this is a real story. She had, a, had this thing and um, I, could, I could get her to probe it while I'm looking at it. And, uh, you know, we had a look to see how deep it was. Um, now, one comment I would make is that the, it is good to have a decency of a camera. If you just do this live, you will have a, this is just taken out of an iPhone, this one. Uh, we could have done it with a more fancy camera, um, which would have given a high quality. If you did it live, it won't be high, as high quality. So sometimes if I, even though I've got live video, oh, then I would just get this email for the video and, um, and then and just look at it during the consultation. If I didn't have internet, well, they just send it to me when I get when they get back, you know, and they do a video and maybe show how deeply they can probe it. Um, and what's really, I, I would I encourage them to take a video anyway because the reason a video is so useful is you can then send it to the specialist who can make a plan of exactly how we're going to manage this. Now, in this particular case, we also um, I decided this one appeared on my computer screen. I have FaceTime or the equivalent of on the computer screen. I got my um, iPhone out, rang up the um, high-risk foot clinic lady, and you get to know your connections. And I just showed this to her, and then she looked at it and goes, oh yeah, that's, um, yeah, point taken. 
and I said, yeah, do you want to have a chat to the lady? And she said, yeah, yeah, sure. And it's, uh, it's sort of um, quite interesting how you can get these, you know, complex things become quite simple. Um, nice, neat, neat streamlined plan, all in the same consultation. Quite quick, to be honest, because I'm doing a bit of this while the other person's on the other line, under the end of the line, you know, doing things. Now, one little tip I'd say is you should have a tape measure. So that's the thing that was missing in this photo, but you know, you do need to not have an idea of dimensions. The other thing I'd say is you should also ask for more big pictures. So the more the better. So this is actually the lady's foot. So it's relevant to know she's missing her second toe. And it is also quite relevant to know she's got some peripheral edema. She actually had a, um, a suspected, um, uh, so you know, it made the differential of infection or a fracture. She actually had a fracture and that's why she had the leg edema or an unrelated cause of a leg edema. So it was useful to, it's useful often to have the, the bigger picture plus the close picture and do, do remember the uh, tape measure. And just remember, don't rely directly on your phone, your, your, whatever media you have to look at the thing. You will get a better picture out of static pictures or videos that can be sent. If you've got enough internet to do a, a FaceTime, you've got an, enough internet usually to send something, um, even albeit a short video or and pictures certainly. And then you've got this thing that you can use for, um, you know, if you're liaising with other healthcare providers, because I can tell you, a picture tells a thousand words and a video tells a couple more. And, uh, and that for the person at the other end of the line in the, the major tertiary center, that's very handy for them to have an accurate idea of what's really going on. The English language can't capture a picture, I'm afraid. And if you do, it takes so long to describe it. This saves a lot of time. So you do have to, we always have to say to the patient, this is what, who we're gonna use it for. We're gonna send it and then we're gonna get rid of it. And obviously that's part of our, um, you know, when we sign up as doctors, you have that, that confidentiality that you've got to maintain. So there's obviously got to be a few little things around it. Uh, when we, if we store a photo, we'll always be in the patient's file and for monitoring, you know, purely as their file. And again, we ask them that it's a, we just do a verbal permission. So you can have a lot of musculoskeletal things. I mean, the only thing I'd say about musculoskeletal things is have at least two views. So you might, for a hand, you might want that, that, and that. And we always do a video, um, you know, um, and, um, you know, because you get a much better idea in multiple dimensions of what's going on. Again, we, we used, used to use, we actually do take photos and videos, even if, it, if it's, even if I can see it clearly live, if we need to liaise with someone else. So this is one where I would have liaised with, with the, the local hospital, which is miles away, you know, to make a plan. Um, and, you know, here's a skin lesion. Again, if you don't have a tape measure, if they forgot their tape measure, get them to use something else. So you can see here, I don't know if you can see, but on the right hand, there's a, a discoid lupus on the left. So yeah, this, you know, this, this lesion with some scarring in the middle and, and in Aboriginal, North Australia, that's the just you can call it on and lip. The you might notice um, on the other side there's a sugar, one of those little sugar strips in the packet. So we have a, a bit of an idea how long that is. They didn't actually have a um, um oh I don't know if you can see that. Can I just move the but you probably can see that they're, they're just using that as some idea of the measurement. It is important to have some idea how big the thing is. So otherwise, how are you going to monitor it? No. And again, this would have gone to a dermatologist if you're unsure, or telederm if you've got, if you've got Acrim, you know, or whoever you're local. But it's good to have nice little relationships with those people that you do with. with you know, you, you get to know your specialist, don't you? Now, is the next patient, this is me actually, because I didn't want to take, I didn't get any permission. So this is me <laughs> for this. So um, this is useful in the time of COVID. You can do selfies to do look at throats. You don't need to look at a throat. Firstly, you've got to ask yourself, do you need to look at a throat? I mean, I've got a bit of a sore throat and you've got no red flags. I mean, I, I, quite, I don't even care what's in the throat. Even in Aboriginal settings, if they don't have a runny nose, I'll presume it's strep throat. If they do have a runny nose, I won't. You know? <laughs> and if they're over the age of 40 and never had rheumatic heart disease, it's not an issue anyway. So you've got to ask yourself, what's the point in examining a throat? But if you do, and you do have red flags, I can't follow the saliva, it, it's, it is useful. And, uh, so you can, and you can just get people to do their own selfies. Um, we do this with Aboriginal people in our population, they understand it. And I'm nowhere near the patient, by the way. No way am I going to get COVID because I'm miles away, so it's safe. But I'm the one looking at the picture, making the decision. So 
you can do you can use technology you know to your advantage you can do a lot of eye exam from the top anyway this is my exam this is the, with the next patient they're probably just showing me the throat and i go yep good <laughs> you know whatever's relevant about it you can get rid of using that um i just got a camp torch there because i'm on a farm and i didn't have a torch but you know you can use something you know an eye you don't often you don't even need a torch and if you do just use your you know pen light that you can clean Here's a lipoma, the next case of the day, I'll put them on the theatre list. I'll just, we'll just explain the procedure, talk to the surgeon, bang, they're on the list. Next one, a sick patient. Okay, I didn't take a photo. This is, I'm just reenacting a sick patient. In COVID, given the time of COVID, we've moved all our clinics outdoors and see them all outside, the whole clinic's outdoors. Um, but um, the point I wanted to make from a telehealth point of view here is that you can get a lot from telehealth of the sick patient. You can you can see if they look sick. You can see their work of breathing. You can see the SATs. You can see the pulse rate. You can see the blood pressure. If you've got loudspeaker, you can even monitor the patient while they while the rest of the staff go off and do something else, like you know find something that they needed. So you can even be a third person. Um, you can do that. You could be doing the phone calls for the um, you know with the emergency people. Um, uh, I'd love it if the emergency people had to say FaceTime and all those themselves and could quickly look at these things, but you no, know, we don't have the fancy, you know, set, setups that the hospitals have that, that they like to go through. But you know, you get your friendly ED, you know, so that would be a nice thing one day. But at least um, I can see what's going on, and um, you might notice we do everything from behind. For we, in fact, all our examinations in the time of COVID are behind. Abdo, uh, everything except the abdo exam, and there you just get them to. You know, get them to move their neck to the other way. Um, I even flicking a person's eyelid is done from behind. Um, photo selfies for the face, eyes, um, and everything else: cut, heart, chest, neck, cannulas, venipunctures, punctures. Even um, how are we going to do nasopharyngeal swabs? Is we do it fully from behind, so you're not in front. Anyway. Now, I ramble on there, but what I was going to say here is the point from telehealth point of view is you can get a lot of information. Now, there are different ways to send the ECGs. You get those really high quality ones you see on Life in the Fast Lane when you've freshly done an ECG. This is um, what you might get if they email one to you. And that's the kind of thing you'll get if they just take a photo. This is the, this, that's one where they just literally just got the screen. They did an ECG, put it on the computer screen, got the photo and took a photo of it. And that's the quality we got. And I think that's useful. You can get a lot of info. You can look at the codec. Um, you can see a lot of information. And you can get a feel for how they're handling the emergency. And you can also get a feel for how well their infection control is. So there's a lot of useful stuff there. Um, and I could keep on going. I could tell you a few other papers. The only one I'd say is about um, supervision. Um, and the comment of, um, uh, well, there's a few things that make, so I'll give you a few examples of how other patients, other things we do. Um, let's say they're doing, um, they might have a, they might be really busy in the clinic and uh, I need to, and they're, they're short a person and you really want to talk to that diabetic about that HbO1c and, you know, discuss insulin or, you know, discuss some medication change. I can do that. So they can go off and see some other people and I'll do that and write in the notes. Um, now you. Obviously, the Medicare aspects, you've got to work. I'm not talking about Medicare stuff here today, but, you know, um, but that's, I could have, um, what else could I have? I could be in a family meeting to discuss something serious. In the Aboriginal setting, there's a lot more faith in the person they know. Even if I'm on telehealth, if they recognise me and they know me and they go, hey, John, I know you've been around for years. I tell you what, it works just as well on telehealth and as it does outside. In fact, they can be quite close and personal because they can talk to you like this. They're looking right up to you and you can um, really have a lovely conversation with them and you can have your family meetings. Um, another little tip is um, if you've got that new that staff member and you want to do a, on, uh, let's say, a, a direct observation to see how they're faring, see how they're taking that history, Northern, uh, in the NTGPE, so the Northern Territory Medical Educators, we've had video ECTs for years, and all they do is they just get some decent camera thing and video the consultations, and and then the then the medical educator looks at it, and it's amazing how good they can be if you have the right um, setup. 
Um, sometimes we just do, sometimes, so we use either, I mean, we just use something simple like that, you know, just a little uh, thing. And, but you can imagine, you really can actually take, even if it's a short part of a consultation and you're just stepping in, you can get a real feel for how your trainees are going. Now, I always come in and watch them for a week at the start because I think it's still good to know people personally, but it's useful in that way. Um, uh, another setting we have, and, and you know, if, if I don't have internet, I can get at least videotape an important consultate, a very important examination or something. And you know, when the when the patient knows who's it for, if they know it's for something that someone that they know, if they get, you know, they've got that trust. We've, we've never actually had troubles. I've never actually had a video de consult decline. Very rare. It's some women's business. Okay, fair enough. But I'm a man, you know. <laughs> That's a, that's a fair call and we don't try that one, but, but you, you really can get a lot of information um, from either rec if you don't have internet recording or doing a live observation of your trainees. And uh, that's added a lot of level of safety for us. I get a feel for, because you know, when you hear it over the phone, it's like, yeah, okay, you said the heart exam, you, you said the musculoskeletal exam is X and Y, but how did you do that musculoskeletal exam exactly? You know. <laughs> Now there's a few exams you can't do. I can't do a procedure. I can observe a procedure. I've certainly done, once we're happy someone's done a few procedures, I've sometimes observed a procedure being done, but I can't step in and do anything about it. And I certainly can't demonstrate it. I can't feel what they're feeling in an abdo exam. I can look for tenderness. I can pick jaundice, I can pick, but I can't, I can't feel masses and I can't feel the lymph glands. Um, I can, I can't tell the strength in a neurological exam, although I get a feel for how hard they're pushing. Um, and I can't listen to what the heart sounds and breath sounds they're listening to. As I said, we do have a lip, we've been trying it recently with these Lippmann stethoscopes. They're quite good quality. It's just that they're, I don't know, we just haven't really, I think we've never, I don't know, we've never had the energy to really push it. <laughs> sort of, it's not like it's live screaming where you can hear the heart sound as they're hearing it. You, they record it and then you've got to send the recording. And I don't know, that doesn't work for me very well, but, um, but we could, you know, um, it's an option, you know. But, um, but I think for a lot of assessments, um, you can. Skin, musculoskeletal, abdo tenderness, certainly. Um, if, we had a, if we had an ultrasound, you could watch them do the ultrasound, you know. Um, you know, because you're watching them, how they're doing the probe, you can see the image has been generated. You, you can trust, you know, there, there is a degree of, um, and there's been work in that, doing that in other countries. And I think, you know, I guess my point is, obviously you've got to work within the safety of what you think, but you have to remember what you're comparing it with. Um, if you're doing telehealth anyway, why not make it a, as safe as possible? You know? And uh, it certainly has added uh, levels of safety for us that we would never have had. And that, um, and in some ways, there's one other advantage to telehealth that you may never thought of, and that's availability. Normally, if I'm seeing, if I'm seeing a patient in the room next door and the trainee's there and you're going, oh, should I go in, should I knock on the door? Well, boom. I, and usually, I'm, and likelihood is I'm gonna be there because I'm not seeing another patient, I'm doing telehealth. So um, it's, it's got one secret availability, which adds, which adds a wealth of safety and that is availability. Um, so I don't know. It's one of those things that you, everyone's a judge of it. I've just told you what we do. So John, we've, we've got a question here from Julia. And mm. she said, do you have any tips for engaging with Aboriginal patients over the phone? We don't yet have telehealth facilities and I've found things can be misinterpreted over the phone. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm hearing from you in your, your description of your experiences that you've had another clinician on the other end. Um, yes. Yeah. What What about when you don't have another clinician on the end? How do you oh, yeah. you go about engaging with uh, an Aboriginal patient? Yeah, fair enough. Uh, so we do. Now we do. I forgot to completely mention that we actually do do that as well. Um, where there's sufficient internet for, we will, we've we've had FaceTime with directly with the patient. Um, I think it is trickier if you don't know them. There's no doubt that um, it's good if you're have some familiarity with them. Um, uh, I think that I think the same rules of communication still apply that you uh, have long, you know, just do the open-ended question, long gaps, let it let it sink, 
Um, using visual media when you're explaining things is for the, certainly for the East and Northern, for the most, of, I've worked in a few Aboriginal communities in North Australia and they're all pretty in common, got one thing in common, they're extraordinarily visual. Um, so when you're describing things, make, I, we often, I'll often take use of, make use of my iPhone to show them. I'll, I'll, I'll find something on the computer that's relevant. If I've, I hopefully I've got something already relevant and I'll show them what I'm seeing so they can visually see it. And I found that works because often there's a language, in our setting there's a language, the other things are language barriers. And a picture does tell a thousand words, but what's beautiful about it is it's a thousand words is in any language. And uh, what's really good about that is, so I've had, I've had patients who've gone through multiple translators, multiple years, and all we've just done is to turn them a quick visual PowerPoint. There was one that they did with the, the uh, foot actually, was like that. And the next day she wanted to go to the high-risk foot clinic after refusing for months, simply by seeing it in a picture. We just showed pictures of what is going to happen to it if we do nothing, and here's what, what, here's what the procedure, and here's what we could do, what would happen, we're thinking, if, and here's the procedure, and what we would hope would happen after the procedure. And then, you know, and uh, that, that, so I think for us visual, um, I would say it's important to know when, uh, you need to know who else is, if it's kids, you really need to know who the decision maker is. So you really need to know who else is in the room. I think that's important too, uh, for privacy. Um, I, I think it, 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 I think I must say it's enormously helpful if there is someone on the other end, but if you're doing it as a phone consult, um, a visual consult, I would say try to use visual media, not just the phone, uh, number one. Because I think vision make visual thing makes a big difference in that setting. Um, otherwise, it's just I think the same rules with um, and the other thing about visual is you get a feeling if you've made a boo boo, because the first thing you'll notice when you make a boo boo with an Aboriginal person, it's my experience, is what you see. You'll see this expression and you realize and they'll suddenly look downcast and you realize oh bugger I've done something, and uh, and then you might say yeah. You know, and I'm just always asking and just using, you know, terminology that's appropriate for the person, for the language. Um, um, I'm just trying to think most of, the, what of, most of what I'm saying is just the, uh, and, and also the other thing is if you is to get to know a bit about the background of a person, if you're at the other end and you can find out a bit more of the background of them, do so. And certainly look up the, the file before you get on the, um, the screen because they don't like, they do like, you know, I think you really need to have that full attention effect. And if you're typing in this, you know, or typing just, or just half listening while you're looking at their notes, um, they know. And I think, I think in this setting, in this, the setting we're talking about it, those, those things really can come and bite you. Um, you, you just mentioned um, privacy. How, how do you go about managing privacy when you know there's other people in the room? I always ask, is anyone else in the room? <laughs> and are you okay for them to be there? Um, yeah. And I do that in any setting. You know, even in a family meeting, like everyone presumes uh, that in typical Aboriginal culture that they're going to have 19 people that will want in the room, but some patients don't want anyone in the room. And so I always, even when I'm doing a family meeting, I ask, that, I always start with the premise that they may not want that. And I always just say, you know, who do you want in this? We're having a family meeting, you have, you know, um, you know like who do you want in it? And, uh, and sometimes I'd say, well, I don't want anyone else. Really, I just want to discuss it myself, or I just want someone. So, so I think I just the, the secret is because you can't tell. Can you? Is there anyone else in my room? Can you tell? No, exactly. So you really do have to ask the question because you can't tell. Normally you would, wouldn't you? And you, and it, it's not instinctive because instinctively we just visually look for it. Um, so you have to make a habit of doing that every time. Now, there's always, always going to be those patients that don't have access to FaceTime and, and multimedia and they've only got the telephone. Sounds like your, your t teleconsult journey began with the telephone anyway. Um, yeah. Having been there to where you are now, what would you um, recommend to those that only have access to the telephone? Um, what I'd say is, firstly, if the patient is able to send... So we're talking about if the person's actually able to, subs is to subsequently send something, even if they're not seeing it live, that can be useful. And I can say it can be a selfie, it can be a, you know, I think if they can send stuff afterwards, that helps. Um, 
I think if you've only got the phone, um, you have to accept the limitation of that. I mean, people have even looked at can you pick up breathlessness by, you know, getting them to really count so many numbers in a, what's that? I'm trying to think, there's a, there's a thing out at the moment um, where you can count, so you can see how much they can count in one breath. Um, and it didn't really correlate that well with hypoxia, unfortunately. <laughs> so um, I, I think it, there, there are limits. I still think you can, uh, because you are having to take the word on the history of what they're saying. Um, you can get a feel for their breathing, but you know, you could get them to go for a walk to a defined distance, particularly if you know what that distance is and back and to see how they are. If you want to gauge the idea of death breathlessness, but I don't know. I think, I think that you have to accept the limits of what a phone can deliver. Um, uh, I would say most people may not have a phone at that point, have a phone at that point in time, but often people, there's someone else in the community that does have a, a phone that can take, they're, quite, they're coming quite common now, the iPhone, the um, Androids. Um, I'm surprised in the Aboriginal communities just how many people have them, and I'm in you know, very remote parts. Um, and that was different to a year ago. Um, so even if they don't have one, maybe see if someone else does have one because, um, and if they can't, if they don't have internet, well, just get them to take a video or something. And then, you know, if someone's coming in, if, they, if there's someone can send it, now obviously it's gotta be, you know, you've got to get around confidentiality. It's gonna be their choice. But uh, I think at the end of the day, um, you have to accept the limits of the phone. It really does have its limits. Um, uh, I think that, takes, that, 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 that actually takes the monkey off your, your back a little bit once you realise that <laughs> there's going to be a limitation with that particular technology and you can only do as much as you can do in that format. Yeah. Um, we've, got, yeah. we've got another query here from um, Bazia who has asked, are there any problems with taking photos of Aboriginal people in respect to um, their religious customs? Um, the secret is you ask them for permission and if it is, they'll say no. <laughs> so, and you, and I guess you get to know your own community. Like, um, but look, I've had you no know, the taboo in our in my community would be the perianal area, and um, and actually, you know, one of the few words I really know how to speak well is guna, which means boo, because I need to, I don't want to emphasize it, so I just want to use the word in their language, so I don't have to. Uh, for a photo of, I've taken, I've had photos of perianal areas. It's not. What's interesting is that you know that should be a taboo. That should be like a no, no, no. But you know, someone's got a problem there. They'll they'll take they'll they'll have a photo. But but you do have to be mindful. The, the secret is to ask them: Is it okay for you as an individual make, making any presumptions about that you that your personal review represents what I'm presuming you are because of your culture? Uh, it's going to apply to. So I think it's always just good to just because you can always say, look, tell me if this is the wrong thing to ask. But um, you know. Is there any chance I'll be able to have a photo, take a photo, you'll be able to send a photo of that just so I can have a look? I promise you I'll delete it. But I just want to, and the reason is because of X and Y, you know, I might want to see if it's something that a surgeon you know, would need or, you know, that it's anything for you to worry about. And, you know, when people got their own health problems, I mean, the worst thing that can happen is they say, oh, no, no. Um, you know, that's, um, now I've never done a, I mean, there are ways to video a corpus, a perhaps a cervical smear. I've never asked that one. I don't think um, I'd never go there. I don't think, but but you know, there's some things that. But I've had but one. I've had a vulva lesion. Um, you know, and it, it enabled very quick treatment. But it, you know, so I think to me, the secret is asking to see what the patient wants, and if you do it in a way that. Uh, that that so, leads really nicely into Ali's question, which was with regard to. Um, uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander patients, patients, whether they're all right um, with the use of personal fo photos um, on personal phones. Um, but I guess you're, you're kind of answering that by saying, well, you can only ask. <laughs> and exactly. If they're okay. They're okay. Yeah. And I think it's important to tell them what it's, who it's going to be used for and, 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 and to point out on, that you're, you're either going to throw it away or if it's something that you actually want, like it's a, let's say it's a wound, and you want to seriously monitor it for its uh, size, say, look, well, do you mind also if you put it in your file? No one, only, only the health staff can see it, uh, but, you know, just to see how it looks so we can follow it up. And, you know, if you can explain the purpose, yeah, exactly. I, 
I can't, I've had some astounding sights of the body taken photos of where I've, I've been surprised but there's no problem. But I've also had people who have refused photos that I would be surprised of and it was fine. It was just like, okay, no problem. You know, I had someone, you know, leg ulcer and they didn't want a photo of it. It's like, so that's okay, yeah. no worries. We'll, 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 we'll go to plan B, you know. We've got, a, we've got a really good question here and it's around mental health. So um, you would come across mental health um, issues in, in your work across time, but how do you go about um, working through finding out, working with patients that might have a mental health um, issue over um, telehealth? Um, the first thing is I try and, I try and very much, I very emphasise the privacy thing. And sometimes even the clinic room is not private enough. Um, so it might be because, you know, they think that, you know, because they think, well, it's only a thin wall, who's listening outside? And so sometimes we just, you know, it depends on what the internet range is like, um, but I, um, will find, you know, just, we we'll just, we we'll just find a nice quiet, quiet spot uh, or somewhere. Um, and, uh, you know, because I'm still, you know, so that's how we do that. Um, Obviously, you can't have a uh, an escort if it was that sort of situation. You usually don't need an escort. For, uh, the other thing is visual. You can't pick up power transference over the phone, and you lose a lot of the communication if you can't see them. So I'd highly suggest that that be done with video over the phone. You know how you get that thing, and you, and someone goes silent on the other end of the phone. And you're thinking, oh, did I upset them, or did I this or that? Whereas if you had it on video, you'll find that they just ducked away for a cup of tea, or they, you know. You, <laughs> The vision, the pictures, I think, I think um, vision is extraordinarily important in mental health. Um, otherwise, it's just the same. In fact, what I like about it is you can get really up close with them, closer than you can actually, would actually get a lot of the time in the consultation. And they can be in the setting that they feel comfortable with if you've got the internet, which you may not. Um, no. And, and they can really, you can really spend the time with them. And because I'm doing telehealth, it's a little bit more spaced out in my experience. You don't have the 15 minute boom, 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 necessarily. Maybe you do. I'm just present, you know, but if you're, if you're the, um, you know, sometimes you can have a bit more time sometimes. Um, and the examination adds nothing much, does it? I mean, it can. I, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I shouldn't say examination doesn't add anything. Of course it does, but most of it's talking, isn't it? And uh, I think, yeah, so I think it's, it's good. Um, and I think they like seeing you. There's a fair amount of um, group health promotion education sessions that happen within AMSs and the likes. Do you think that telehealth will, um, will lend itself to that continuing in the current environment? Um, it depends on the atmosphere, because often those group things are in a really nice, I mean, for us, it's a nice spot under a tree. You get out the, um, the G and Matt and, you know, and people have a bit of a yarn and it's all done in a traditional way. And uh, that's the most, for me, that's in my setting, that's the most comfortable setting that the patients have for those things. So I guess that's a little bit hard to do unless you've got the internet. You could do the one where you, you can do the big screen one where you're up on the big screen and uh, you're chatting away. Don't make it up high though, put it at the same level as everyone else. Except the only problem with that is you're then going to put it up high if you don't, if you want it, you know, safe from you know, the, the four-year-old kid that comes around with a stick afterwards and that's the, you know, anyway, but the point I guess is, um, I think it's good to have them down. I think it would work with the screen. We do have, we do have the big screens for, um, for specialist consults. Oh, that's something I should say about specialist consults. They're so much better with telehealth. You've got a nurse next to the patient or you ring in, you know, they actually then, you don't have to, you know, I've never had, a, I've hardly ever had a specialist read my referral letter. I don't know if you, and you certainly can't have that lovely two-way conversation when you send them to a specialist. Whereas when you have this telehealth things, you can you can have a, you know, I can send them the stuff that's relevant. It doesn't matter if they don't read the specialist letter because I'm going to tell them what the problem is from my perspective anyway. And I can clarify things. The nurse can be next to the patient. They go, yeah, did you understand that? No, not really. And But then we know at least what they didn't understand and we might be able to explain it to them after. A thousand times better the consults. But anyway... But in terms of what you're talking about, yeah, I, I think um, not. I think they could still work, but I think it's a bigger screen or an iPad. iPad would work, and you have you're all going to be in a smaller group around the thing, and 
you know, you've got to think of the size of the screen because if you've got people in a group, how are they going to see you if it's one of the, if it's just a phone? So you have to just think of adjust the size and make it down lower. No, there's there's loads of people with um, uh, hearing conditions and and that are hard of hearing. So how do you manage that when you're consulting with patients with that? Um, well, I get around it because I've got the pa I've got a I'll, I'll have a nurse or someone next to the patient. The other way you can do it is though if you don't have a, a health worker and you've got your is just have someone else on the phone and then use them as the intermediary because they're talking. And if you do have visual, they may be well able to lip read. A lot of people are pretty good at lip reading. So visual has an advantage there. But if you, let's say if you, you just got a phone, um, or even if you don't, having just someone else that they're next to um, and liaising, talking through with them, so you're always taking the history through them, can, can get around that problem. And we do have a lot of people with hearing problems, so that's quite common, yeah. Now, do you issue scripts in your role? Yeah, just do it. Um, get a PDF printer, boom. I email it to the pharmacy. It's quicker, saves paper. It's actually quicker than when I used to write scripts. I'm actually, it's more, I'm, I'm actually the quickest at writing scripts um, in the health service. I'm quicker than the worst person who's on site. Um, except, in fact, they, in fact, they have changed to QPDF because they realise it's quicker even on site. <laughs> so, um, and... And you know it's got there. I get an email back from the pharmacy. Yep, yeah, got it. I can CC another health service so that they know we've made a change to the medicines. Yeah, right. And so, um, does the patient identification at the start of a consult is that any different to um, any other patient for an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person? Um, if you've got, I guess, if you're if you've got someone else there, like an intermediary, well, obviously they will. They'll probably do the groundwork. They'll start the consult and they'll say, hey, let's get uh, John, you know, you want to, then I'm on the thing. Um, if it's, um, if they, sometimes they just put me straight on the thing, say, hey, look, I'm a bit busy. Do you mind having a chat to so-and-so? Uh, and then I'll just start, start saying hello. I guess the only thing is I like to, uh, you know, like every, like it, just as if you're in the room, it's nice to be able to read the notes, you know, have a quick look at the screen beforehand and that's nice to know. But no, but, but that happens in real life too, isn't it? You patient just hits the, just comes in and you're like, who are you? Um, that's the same thing. I've got the medical file in front of me and I just go through the thing. One thing I should say, sometimes I don't have the medical file in front of me. Maybe I'm on, I, I've done consults from Turkey on a vineyard, you know, on the mobile phone and maybe I don't have the phone, the computer right in front of me. So I guess there you've got to sort of remember back to the patient and write something in the notes after that. No, I always make sure I put the, we have a different mode when we write notes to say this is telehealth mode um, in the file so that people know this is a telehealth consult. I think that's important because otherwise someone will look back and they go, well, why didn't you examine the belly? You know, <laughs> you think, well, because I'm a telehealth, I can't, you know, like, so I think it's good for people to understand. Um, yeah, I think it is good to uh, specify the mode you're in. Yeah, and definitely. Anyway. And uh, in regards to images and um, videos and those sorts of things, um, what, how do you manage them in terms of the medical record? Are you retaining them, saving them? I mean, obviously there's been um, advice in Victoria that um, any recorded consult has to be kept for um, a very long number of years. Um, that yeah. will be different across different jurisdictions, but, but mm -hmm. how are you managing that? If it's, if it's something where we just wanted to... Um if, what I often do is I talk to the patient and the person will talk to the patient and say, look, do you mind if we send this photo to so-and-so just to have an opinion? And then they might turn out spending it to a specialist. And if I need to send it to a specialist, I say, do you mind saying I'm just going to send it to a specialist? And the idea is that I then, and we say that we'll then throw it away. And we do. We throw it away. Now, it's, um, if, on the other hand, it's something where we want to monitor them with, where we think it's worthwhile keeping. And quite frankly, we keep a lot of our ear otoscopy things. If you're following up someone's ear so we can compare it with the last time or their skin thing or the wound or some skin, you know, or if it's something relevant, we will keep it. But what we do is we don't keep it in the medical, we don't keep it in the medical software. We keep it in a separate file because otherwise it's going to clog up your system. But we have it in a secure file. So we have it, you know, we have this uh, special file you need to have access to get into you know only certain people are allowed to you know put their password and they get in and they can see the pictures and uh, 
Um, and we have identifiers, so we use their, uh, we call them ID numbers, but you know, your HRN, the MRNs, I don't know, whatever you call your medical identifier. And you have some kind of identifier for the person, and then you just know that's where it's going to be. And then you just go in there um, and look for it. So in terms of are we being naughty by throwing out the files that we've, that those photos that we promised we would throw away to the patient? I don't know. Um, I don't want to know. Um, <laughs> quite frankly, I don't. And I'm never going to get in trouble from a patient about that. Um, yeah. But I don't think. But you know, I look at skin lesion. You know, I mean, there's certain things that you know are medically legally going to be a bit more of a problem. Um, so I think a skin lesion is worth keeping if you're sending if it's a potential cancer or something that could come back and bite you. I think those things are well worth you know documenting. Here's the photo. Because otherwise everyone's going to go, well, you missed the melanoma, but the, you've, got, you've got no evidence, do you? You go, well, 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 it didn't look like a melanoma. And I sent it to that person and, oh, yeah, they won't have it either now. Um, oh, well, you know, <laughs> yeah, here's my handcuffs, you know. So, so I, think, um, I, I think I would be, if you think it has any potential medical legal consequence, I think it's worth recording them. And then just, but don't, we, as I say, we just keep it in a separate file. We don't clog up our... The medical, I don't know about you, but a communicator would die if we did that the way we use it. So we wouldn't, couldn't do it. Now I'm just yeah. thinking about um, context um, type stuff as well, but it's a lot of um, locums that work throughout AMSs throughout the country. Mm. Um, if you've got somebody that doesn't know the patients that they're, that they're seeing for the first time via telehealth, do you have any, um, tips and tricks for, for somebody that's meeting a, a patient for the first time within this context? Yeah, that's a good point. Um, it's, it's a disadvantage for them because relationship is very important for a lot, at least a lot of the, cult, the Aboriginal people I've been exposed to. It's, it's, even in Sydney, relationships seems to have this, you know, family and relationship is important. There's that build up of trust. I think that's very relevant, but, um, uh, not, not, I'm, I'm in I'm in a country town, but it's um yeah I I think um, tips for them I think they need to, I think it's if they can go up and I know in the time of COVID nineteen that's not easy but if they can go up and you know chat and um, you know meet you know meet staff meet you know get to get a feel for a place I think it helps I think the more orientated they are the better if if you can't do that and I appreciate it in COVID nineteen that setting that may not be a luxury you have um i think you should certainly you can get you can team viewer anyone can buy a team viewer and, and and tap into their computer and take them through the medical file and getting them very familiar with how you do things you can do orientation on day one with them in another state another country wherever and um and you can help them become very familiar with the computer system I think you can do the orientation with webinars very effectively. I think when you've got when you've got that patient situation like that, I think it is good if there's a nurse or someone for or someone if you know whoever to sit in on the consultation at the patient end if it's practical. If you're talking about that type where the patient comes in the clinic, um, the other thing you can do you can do three way. Uh, it's a bit more complicated in my books, but you know some of the Depends on your patients, but you know, and Mike wouldn't mine couldn't do this because we don't they don't never seen these things before and they don't have enough internet to be used to it. But you know, if you have people familiar with Zoom or any of those things, you could have three way, you know, linkages. So you've got someone else just sitting in checking they're okay, how they're doing things. I don't know if you can do that with some of the simpler, more easy to use technologies. I've never looked into that. Like I don't know if um you can get three way you can get three way for quite you know multiple way for a few things. So you can actually utilize. I so either having a, a someone on staff is listening in to start or uh, getting a feel for them, or having three or if there's the access to the three way thing, which and that like that bit I'm just making up because I know that's possible, but I've never done it. No, but that's how I would think about those sort of things because it is it's hard for a new person, isn't it? Absolutely. So um, you were talking about um, supervising registrars earlier on in the session. Is there anything that you would um, recommend to supervisors that are 
uh, have have got registrars that are also doing telehealth for the very first time um, and advice that they should be pointing out to their registrars as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I think they need to have some familiarity. Because I think the things I would say is, I mean, if, if you have the luxury of getting to know them for a quality time for a short stint, that's great. I appreciate that's not probably what we're talking here. If you're talking, but um, in terms of the actual telehealth, I think I would invest in the good decent that they have some decent technology. So I think handy things to have is a um, a good phone. Even just find out what phone they've got, make sure it's a decent one. I think personally, if you're doing otoscopy, I like I love Welsh Talon cameras. You know, uh, those you know all the. I mean, uh, to me, that's you've, you've just got ears just covered like that. Um, better than you would if they were face to face. Uh, if you're on site, um, I think uh, um, I think they should know how to you take pictures and films properly. So one thing is, um, if there's a spe some start some either you have a stand and you can do footage if they don't have anyone who can help them, or whether someone else comes in the room and does the um, holds the video while they do the exam. But I think. Uh, I think video ECTVs are really good if you can. So if you don't have the, the internet and say no good, just get them. I think it's good to start normalising the possibility of a video ECTV. Enter GPE as a way of doing it very legally without with minimal risk. Um, they've done it for years with medical educators. Why should, it shouldn't be any different for a um, supervisor. In fact, um, I, we've actually done them um, and, you know, and it seems to be fine. So, so video ECTVs, if you're you know, trying to, you know when you do that one where you want to directly sit in? Um, and, and I think a stand is handy if, you, if, if, it's, if, if you just want to, they want to plop it on there while, you've been, while, they, while you watch them do something that they're not sure of. I think them getting in the way of just appreciating that photos need tape measures and that they need close up and far up and that videos are great um, for watching for exams and that, getting the way of sending things to you during consults and um, I'm trying to think what else. I think the other thing is team viewer into their computer. So you can, you can do case analysis of, you know, have a look at the files and you could even take them through results together live. You're actually both in the same computer and you're actually, I don't know if you've done team view, but it's, it's pretty cheap and you just go into their computer and you can even just take, you're, they're seeing them, you're both seeing the same medical file and you're going through together talking about the case. You might be talking about going through results, how you interpret liver function just to say, okay, what do you think? Well, let's go and look at the patient's main summary here. What do you reckon? What do you think of this? What, you know, um, you can, um, so you can, you can get a really good um, case-based um, learning, I think, from, and I think the other thing is, is being at the speed, making sure you try to be a, the ultimate supervisor is the one who's available. And you, when you're, a, when you're um, doing it from, by telehealth, you, are, but you often are more available, much more available. And so just encourage them to contact you. And if you have a game plan B for who else they can contact, you know. And, uh, you know, that's um, because uh, sometimes you've got more than two, more than one person on telehealth. You know, people who are over the age of a certain age, you'll have certain criteria where they where they have got to stay at home, don't they? So you can have um, spares, you know, having reserves and all that. Yeah. Right, yeah. Well, listen, um, we've uh, reached our hour, and I would like to thank you very, very much, John. That was a really interesting um, run around your neck of the woods. Um, I'd also like to thank everybody that was able to make it here tonight. Uh, and uh, we hope that you found that particularly useful. So we acknowledge the uh, Australian Government uh, who fund GPSA under the Australian GP Training Program. Thank you all very much and have a great night.